Hey, what's up guys? I am Joe from Workbench, and this week we're gonna continue looking at how to rig in After Effects. So if you didn't see part one, go check the link in the description, watch that first, and then come back and let's get going. First off, apologies, I am sick today, so I'm gonna sound like crap. I managed to avoid this plague for like two weeks, but somehow uh, everybody around me got sick and kept getting sick, and so here we are. Since it made sense to build on last week's tutorial, Sev isn't doing one this week. But that's okay, because I forced him to do all the redshift renders, because I don't have redshift. Anyway, let's go. So this week, we're going to take a look at a slightly better way to build this forklift. There's still a lot of layers and connections involved, but building this in 3D instead of Affinity makes it a little bit easier to rig up. So again, we're going to be building upon the previous tutorial, so make sure you watch that first. The link is in the description below. Also, we're not really focusing on how to actually rig this particular forklift because the idea is to actually give you tools so that you can build rigs and expressions and stuff that will suit whatever you want to build. If you want to know how anything else in here is built that we're not going to go over, like how all of the stuff is linked, or if you want the Cinema 4D files or any of that kind of stuff, you can grab the project file from our website for a dollar. So let's take a look at how we built this, starting with our main comp. So again, this stuff is built like last week right here. Uh, we have basically our selector thing that turns on and off opacity based on the side that we're at. The angle control is set up the same way, except for this time I call it direction because that made more sense. We still have our lift, we have our wheel rotation, and then we have a bunch of colors. So if we move our lift up, you can see we have this going and we also have, oops, went too far, too far. Not 10, 100, there we go. So you can see we even have this hose that animates with it. And that was something I wanted to add last week, but there was a lot of stuff for just one tutorial, so I figured we'd do it in this one. So we also have this wheel rotation controller and you can see that rotates the wheels. Not a lot because there's just a little bit of variation, but you can see them moving around. All right, let's zero this stuff back out. Not that it matters, but you know, whatever. So let's take a look at how each one of these things is set up. So if you can see, I have them labeled Northeast, Southeast, Southwest, Northwest. And that's because each one of these comps is basically one like this. While it's nice to have everything in one comp, doing it like this allows us to save on some expressions. And I could have cut down further on expressions by not having these sub comps that basically contain each direction of each element. But then you'd have four comps with a whole bunch of junk in it. So it's kind of a trade-off. But if I were to rebuild this, I would probably do it that way just to make it a little bit quicker. It would also be a little bit easier to rig because you wouldn't have to bring in this side control over here from the main comp all the way through. Although note, I don't have that in the controller here, and that's part of the checks that I've removed. Instead of having these things check to see which one they are, because I know this is gonna be one direction, which is two in this case, we just hard code that into the side property here. But of course, since we do have this one here, and there are four different directions contained in this guy, we have to then check to see which one we're gonna display. So that's the check you can remove by putting everything in each one of these directional comps. So that's the main setup on each one of these things. Since we know what direction we are, we have the side hard coded, and then we pass on the lift variable from the beginning, and then each one of these comps has their colors and they all have colors in here. And these colors are also passed through into the main. And that would be where you would change them when you're actually doing stuff in here. So you can make things like these sides be blue if you wanted them to be or whatever. So let's go back into the Southwest comp. And there's one thing to note and that's the tires here. They're actually matted by the cab and everything that's attached to that. But they're above it because otherwise you have this weird mat out of here in the back that we ended up with. So since we were already matting that, it made more sense to just put it on top of the cab. So that's the only kind of layering thing in here that's kind of odd. I'm not sure how Sev rendered that part. I think he just made the cab and everything else a matte object, but don't quote me on that. So let's jump in the individual elements and start with tires. You can see we have the side in here, and that determines which one of these blocks to turn on. And each one of these blocks is set up in an interesting fashion. In order to make this thing work where we can change things out, like if you wanted these wheels to be like, I don't know, green, something weird like that, Maybe you're doing a John Deere thing or something, who knows, I don't know. We're basically setting this up so that we have a pass of light over top of colors. So this is set to two, which I believe is this first one here. So you can see that's what the pass looks like. Well, not exactly. The pass looks like this. We basically just rendered a gray model. So by rendering what is essentially a clay pass out of cinema, we can separate the colors from the lighting using the lighting information with a blend mode to change colors inside of After Effects. This one didn't have the dynamic range that I wanted, Without having to go crazy into making the highlights over bright and the shadows too dark and all that kind of stuff, we kept the lighting that I had already set up. And then here I added levels to kind of bring this back into a range that I needed for the overlay. Because where there's not really any light or dark hitting anything, we kind of want it to be middle gray. That does make it a little bit grainy because I had to crank it so much. But I didn't mind adding that noise to it. If you want to do the same thing, you basically just need to tweak these lights and the shadows and everything until you have a range that looks more like this. 
So I'm at it. That's pretty much how every 3D piece in here is handled as far as being able to recolor it. So using that with an overlay on top of these colors that are just basically that flat color and this flat color, we get fully 3D colored wheels and tires. So the base of these is a puzzle mat. And so if we turn these off, you can see this is what it looked like originally. So in this case, I wanted the wheels. So we use a set mat to get the blue channel only, and then we just fill it. So because of the way that normally works, you can have three different colors, a red, a green, and a blue. And the only object in here that uses more than one puzzle mat is the cab. So the cab is split up into two different puzzle mats because we have four colors on that one, I think. So let's turn these back on, unsolo that, and then let's take a look at the expression that we have in here. So we have a time remap expression, and I've already got it up in Expressionist over here. So what we want to do is figure out what frame to pull from the sequence that we've rendered. In this case, we rendered 30 frames with two degrees of rotation in between each one. And why did I do it that way instead of just one degree per frame? Uh, it's because I didn't want to have so many files with it. But you're probably not going to notice a one degree difference in this thing, but I do want the angle control to be proper. So when we bring it in here and we set it as variable F, we're going to modulus that angle control by 60, not 30. And in case you're curious, the reason why we did 60 degrees is because that is one rotation from one of these lugs to the next one. Everything around this tire is based so that it will repeat every 60 degrees. So then we check, as we did before, if this value is negative, we add 60 to it. And again, this makes it so that our angles, when they go negative, continue to rotate in the proper direction. So again, say this is at negative 72. If we just took the absolute value of that, we'd be facing this direction instead, which is a completely different rotation. So set that back to zero. And let's press on. So now we have a frame value in the range of 0 to 59, because 60 will modulus back to 0. But we again only have 30 frames. So we're going to divide it by 2. So we do F divide equals by 2. That basically says take F, divide it by 2, and then set F equal to that. And then all we end there with is F times this comp dot frame duration, because we need this value in seconds and not frames. So this converts that for us. So that's how we handle that in here. You could also handle the forklift in the same way by rendering the forklift moving up and down. It's just pretty easy to link it up in here. But if you wanted to have like the chain that's actually in the thing move or like some gearing or anything more complex like a front end loader or something like that or a bulldozer or whatever, or maybe like the front piece angles, this would be a good way to do it. It technically also cuts down on things you have to link up. Because in our case, the forks and the two stages could all just be one piece with the associated puzzle mat and then you can just use a slider to slide through the frames. So I know what you're thinking, because Seb said it. Why wouldn't you just do this in 3D? And the reason is, every different variation that you need, you'd have to render a different version for that. And while that might not be a pain, it might be to somebody that's just using After Effects. If you have like one 3D guy on staff, but you have 15 After Effects artists, you can give all of those After Effects artists this thing, but they would all have to ask the 3D guy to re-render a forklift that maybe it moves in, and then the fork goes up, or it moves in and the fork goes up. There's all sorts of different variations that are possible in the After Effects file once you have this set up that you can't do in cinema without having to re-render things. So it might be helpful, especially if you're doing things for a company or whatever, where everything is built in a certain way, to do it this way instead. Also, just because we can. And changing colors is even faster than Redshift. So let's check out the hoses. This one's kind of my favorite, and it's based on one that we did last week where basically we're going between value at time things. But in this case, we get to actually animate a full path moving, which I thought is pretty neat. And again, it goes for different angles. So this is like a hydraulic hose I built in this, uh, and it has no real actual purpose. And I don't believe a forklift actually has one, but I thought it was cool and it adds kind of something to the forklift. So now we're doing it. Maybe I just built my forklifts better than you do. Or maybe my forklifts can fire the forks off at its enemies. Huh? What'd you say? All right, so anyway, this one's a pretty simple thing here. We're gonna open up our expressions here and these paths are pretty much the same thing. So let's bring that guy in there. And as you can see, it is super complicated to do this, like just mind bogglingly difficult. So we have a variable lift and that is from our lift slider that continues all the way back through to all the way to the main comp. And since our lift goes from zero to 100 and this thing basically goes from zero to one second, which is 24 frames in this comp, then we just divide it by 100 so that we have a range of zero to one. And this happens to be keyframe zero, and this is keyframe one. So then we just do this property dot value at time lift. Boom, mind blown. If you had something more complicated, like you didn't build everything off of a zero to 100 scale like I did in this thing, say you're doing the actual lift value, like you wanna go up 900 pixels or whatever, then you could just make this linear. So you would just do linear as lift goes from zero to 900. You'd wanna go from zero to one or whatever. If you want to make this a longer animation, say this is four seconds, then you would just be zero to four. 
just keep in mind that value at time is going to expect seconds. It'd be nice if that would accept frames, but you have to convert it. That's kind of my favorite part of this thing. So the next thing we're going to check out, and it's kind of just a similar thing, is the shadows that we have in here. And they're built basically the same way. So if we open this guy up, you can see I have four keyframes, and these correspond to the four directions that we have. And they're conveniently at one second apart. So 24, 48, and 72. So in this case, we have our side variable, which is 0, 1, 2, or 3. So we set T for time equal to that side control. And then we do this property dot value at time, T. So it gets us a shadow that matches our directions. There's a similar thing on forks for the fork shadow, but it has one more fun thing. Well, technically two more. I'll bring this up here. Oh, there's a squirrel trying to get in my bird feeder. Anyway, we have the feather here set to a linear. As lift goes from zero to 100, we're gonna go from a feather of 41 to 80. And feather is an array, and I want them both to be feathered equally, so we just do lift comma lift. Opacity is very similar, I just limited it differently. So we have our linear here, same thing, lift as it goes from zero to 30. So I want this thing to fade out basically by the time it's at 30. I could have feathered it up to 30, but I didn't feel like dealing with that. So I just did zero to 100 on that guy. This one's zero to 30, and our opacity goes from 30% to zero. So if we take this controller and we move our lift, you can see it fades out as it gets away. Set that back to zero, not negative three. And again, as I said before, you can also limit these lift things so that this actually can't go past here with a linear. But mine's just multiplied like we did last time to save time on that check. And again, if you see this and you don't know that something's wrong, you're in the wrong business. So that's pretty much it on how all of those things are set up and all our cool little expressions that are in this particular rigging tutorial. The only other weird thing I have in here is that uh, the stage thing, since these are actually just one piece and actually they're the same piece because we had a render issue and really they're the same anyway. I just use the same set for each one of these things. So each one of these is a direction. And I don't even have a second layer for each one of these because I could have used its own alpha as our puzzle mat. But really, I just i am going to overlay this thing anyway for the most part. So I just set a fill and then I use CC Composite to overlay the original lighting back on. So that's how all of those are done. That's how this whole thing is done. That, that's pretty much it. There was a lot of time spent in this thing and actually just linking everything. I wish there was kind of an easier way to kind of bubble up these like color controls and everything. It took a lot of time to actually figure out the process we were going to use this thing. We started to do crypto mats, but EXRs and everything in After Effects are still really slow, even with the Fnord update. So we went the PNG puzzle mat route, and it seems to work pretty well. I mean, there's not really a ton of delay for all of the stuff that's in here. I mean, I can still pretty much drag this, and I'm recording. So it's not, not too bad. There's only one thing I'm, I'm going to mention because I ran into it and this was another thing that took some time and it's just a bug, I, I guess. I don't know. I don't know how to cause it, so I can't really help anybody in fixing it. But for a while, I thought there wasn't a value at time that was working as it bubbled up through these things. Like this always worked in here. But as soon as I had it into my motion graphics template, I couldn't bring this comp into another thing and change the master property. It would sometimes switch between directions, but it would never work animating the path. And I think that's because I started some of these controls differently. And when I added them to it, it seemed to have like kind of confused which ones were which. And I've had that happen to me before. And I, again, I don't know exactly what causes it. I think it has to do with reordering different things, but it doesn't always do it. So the fix, if you run into a situation like that, is unfortunately to basically take all of this stuff out of here and build a new comp and then set up your master properties again. I spent probably 45 minutes to an hour on that last night, just sitting there being like, why does this not work? The only reason I found out what was actually causing it was that the thing here was set to basically like two, right? And well, you can't see it on this angle. Let's go here. So two actually changes, you know, just a little bit. So I basically had copied this guy into the other comp and I saw that the one that I copied in was normal and this one was up by two, which was also what the side was set to. And then I realized they were being confused somehow. And I came into one of the comps, I don't remember which one, and I actually moved this slider for the side, and that made it work. But it didn't always work, and it wasn't just flipped, and I had rebuilt some of the sliders and put them in the motion graphics template and everything, and it just was not working right. So it's some, some memory corruption or something that happens between them. So if you sit there for a while and, and something just doesn't seem to work, you might want to try that. Anyway, that's pretty much it. These rigging techniques are pretty useful for different things, so I hope you guys can find some way to use them in your projects. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe. And if you'd like to help support what we do, check out patreon.com slash workbench. Make sure to keep up with the blog at workbench.tv. And as always, I'm Joe, and we'll see you next time.